situations going to be on suicide alert. And this particular topic is, is something that, like I said, is plaguing our country. And it's something that is not talked about enough. Um, whether we realize it or not, we all have somebody that is close to us that has either attempted or thought about suicide. And I just want to go over a few things that um, may be beneficial, some of the information that may help us going forward to address this issue, um, not only for ourselves internally, but for those at large, around, those people we may come across on the street, a word of encouragement, because we just never know how how life is affecting people. You know, we all handle life very differently. And for most people that don't have hope, they feel like suicide is a way out. So, um, I want to start by telling you a little bit about my, my hometown, city of St. Louis, Missouri. It's a, a great city. I love it. Um, I've had a lot of hard knocks coming up in this city. It's made me into the person I am. But um, something that's very, very, um, I find ironic about this city is that it has two sides, right? So we have St. Louis City, and then we have a bridge, which this is a bridge here. It's called Martin Luther King Bridge. And one side of Martin Luther King Bridge is St. Louis City, which is the side the arch is on. And on the completely other side of the city is a side called East St. Louis, Illinois. Now, think about East St. Louis, people don't go there. And if people go there, they go there for the wrong reasons, okay? So East St. Louis is particularly known for gambling. It's a lot of casinos over there. That's where people go to strip clubs, prostitution, get any type of drugs. We call it in St. Louis City the Wild Wild East because that's where all the bad components are. But for me, myself, growing up in St. Louis City, I know that there's uh, an underlying factor that a lot of people don't really pay attention to about St. Louis City. Uh, a staggering fact about my city is that the crime rate is at least 58% more in St. Louis City than you were thinking East St. Louis. You say, well, with all the devastation and the, um, the all the bad things going on over in East St. Louis, you would think, okay, well, they probably have the worst crime rate and they have the worst statistics as far as drugs and narcotics and all these things. But um, yeah, interestingly enough, St. Louis City is leading that. There's probably two or three uh, in the country, one of the most dangerous cities yes. in the U.S. So um, I, I brought this up to say, use it as an analogy. You know, sometimes we look at life, it's easy for us to drive through the ghetto and say, okay, man, it's a lot of crime over there. It's a lot of, you know, things going wrong over there. It's somewhere I don't want to be. And then we go to a suburban neighborhood and we feel a lot safer. But amidst of all that beauty and the glamour and the things that you may feel that there's, there's that's where you want to be, that's where a lot of the, the inbred, indwelt crime and disaster is happening. And I liken that to the play of suicide because a lot of people think that the people that are hurting are the ones that are showing it the most obvious. And that's not always the case. Most of the time, it's the people that you see on a daily basis that will smile every single chance they get when they see you. And deep down, dwelling in them is a hurt and a helplessness and a cry for help. And nobody distinguishes this because they feel like nobody cares. Before, a lot of people handle stress in their lives very differently. And I just want to go over a, a few myths, a few facts, that I want to go forward to understand um, people better and what we can do to help. Myth number one, only adults can get truly depressed. Kids as young as eight or nine can get severely depressed. Depression is an epidemic among teens today. Now why, why would you think it's an epidemic among teens, especially today? I think social media. Social media has played a very big role in that. Social media is probably the biggest component in my opinion. That's why a lot of teens commit suicide. Um, the past several months, there have been three or four posts on Facebook Live of teens committing suicide. Can you actually post? Yes, they posted their, their suicide on Facebook Live. And um, it's it's getting to the point where, it, again, it's not being addressed. And as a, a big conglomerate, I believe it's 
up to social media and Facebook and Instagram to to make this uh, this epidemic known to a lot of people because it's not being heard, it's not being voiced. So teens, kids as young as eight or nine, I gave Ashanti Davis as an example. They're experiencing these things because when they're at home, they they, they look down at a phone or a tablet or a computer and they're saying, "Well, I want my life to be like that. Why am I not receiving these things?" And they compare it to their home. And that lack of love and that lack of care that they're not getting translates to their mind and their heart. And in turn, they eventually end up committing suicide. So that's just one of the myths, facts, that I wanted to present to you all. Another myth is depression is a weakness. The truth is, depression is a serious but treatable illness that has nothing to do with moral strength or weakness. The, the fact of the matter is we all get depressed. At some point in our life, we've all been depressed, whether it's been over work, whether it's been over school, whether it's been over family fallout, everybody gets depressed. It's, it has nothing to do with whether or not you're a mentally stable person or not. But what depression does is, it's a seed that's being planted, and it turns it translate into a seed that depression will become, start to become anxiety. And anxiety um, fluctuates and over time, if it's not treated, it turns into attempted suicide. Because as we know, if I tell, if I tell Laverne, you look nice today, that carries along with her for the rest of the day. If I use a word to tear her down, Laverne, I don't like that skirt. I don't like the way you wear your hair. Those seeds of doubt are being planted. And all it takes is just because she has the idea in her mind, all it takes is somebody else to come along and tell her the same thing. You're not good enough. You can't do this. You can't do that. And you'll start to believe that the human mind is very powerful. And what you feed it, whether it's positive or negative, will soon have an impact on your everyday lifestyle. So depression comes before anxiety? I believe so. Yeah. I believe depression does come before anxiety. Because it depression is more so of a mood. Right. Anxiety is something that it, it's it's pretty much a a growth factor from the depression, but the anxiety is an action. It's mm -hmm. form. You start to see the anxiety play out in a person's life. They get nervous and twitchy right. and antsy about everything. And again, that's when it starts to become negative doubt, negative um, reinforcement to your lifestyle, and then you start having those suicidal thoughts. Another myth that I would like to present to you all is that depression is mostly a white middle class problem. I remember I used to hear this a lot growing up. You would think, okay, well, white middle class people, because they have so much and they don't know what to do with it or whatever the case is, that they could uh, commit a lot of the suicides. But that is far from the truth as well. Depression is an equal opportunity illness that can affect anyone, regardless of race or socioeconomic level. Depression and suicide rates among young African American males and Hispanic teenage girls in particular have dramatically increased in the past 20 years. And of course, this goes back to the whole structure of the home. I can speak for myself as a young African-American male. My biological father wasn't really in my life like that, and that had a, a very tremendous impact on me growing up. Another myth is that people who talk about suicide do not kill themselves. People who are thinking about suicide usually find some way of communicating their pain to others often by speaking indirectly about their intentions. Most suicidal people will admit to their feelings if questioned directly. This all goes back to the theme of, of listening. If you listen to a person, if you take into account what they may be going through throughout the day, what their interests are, what, what's, what, what is their biggest struggle or trial throughout their everyday life, you'll get to see, you'll get little hints as to what that person's thinking how they're living their everyday life. Oh, wow, well, you know, I don't feel like I'm this. I really don't want to be here. That next time I see you, little words, you'll catch little words, you'll catch little actions um, that will trigger certain things as far as to what these people are going through in their life, the pain that they're receiving. Most suicidal people will attempt, uh, will attempt to their feelings no, most suicidal people will admit to their feelings, I'm sorry, if questioned directly. This is very important because a lot of people believe that 
you should just not question them at all. You should just leave the topic be. But that could be the very thing to save their life. You don't have to ask them directly, hey, are you thinking about committing suicide? But again, what's going on? How can I help you? What, what's stressing you throughout your life on an individual and a regular basis? And you will find that oftentimes, this is very helpful to break in the ice and for people to understand. You all can come in close if you like. People understand that there are people out there that do love them and do care and have taken an interest in their struggles. You know, when my, when my husband left my family, I was mm-hmm. with my mother in therapy, mm-hmm. and I didn't think she was, I just wanted her to get some help. Mm-hmm. And she admitted to the therapist that she was suicidal. Really? And that's because the therapist asked her. Right. I've never even thought that was her. Yeah. They just, they're looking for somebody to, to reach out to them. Yeah. That's all. They really don't want to commit suicide. It's just that they want the pain to end. Yeah. And once that pain ends, they feel like, okay, well, this is an end-all, be-all, but they're not looking at the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. I have loved ones that I'm leaving behind. Mm-hmm. I have people, I, I, there are things that God would like me to, to accomplish in my yeah. life that I may never do so. But it's just that one space and moment in time when any of us are feeling down, we're in that particular mm-hmm. space. And for them, it's just that their whole world is crashing down around them, and they don't feel like they have support. Mm-hmm. If I'm down, I know I can call my mom. Yeah. And she'll give me a word of encouragement. But for your average person, or your person that is suicidal or has suicidal thoughts, their main thing is nobody cares. So who, who, who am I going to talk to? Nobody really wants to hear me out. you know. But nothing's further from the truth. Another myth is that there's really nothing you can do to help someone who's truly suicidal. Most people who are suicidal don't really want their lives to end. They just want the pain to end. The understanding, support, and hope that you offer can be their most important lifeline. And really, all it takes is five minutes. It takes five minutes for you to hear a person out, for you to have a conversation with them, you talk to them, you sit with them, and ask them, what's going on with you? How are you doing? What can I do to help? Because that five minutes can make the biggest difference in a person's life. Whether they decide to be here and give tomorrow another chance, or take themselves out. Five minutes, you know, um, I did canvassing work, Bible work in 2014. And leadership is very important in this factor as well because if you have a leader, whether you know, you're at work or you're at school, if you have a teacher that inspires you and you know that believes in you, you'll work that much harder to do extra credit work. And studies have shown that when kids find that they have a teacher that has really invested in them, that they do better. When kids have parents that invest in them, they know they care about them, they do better in school, their grades are higher, their tests are higher. And not only that, academically and socially and morally, they are um, achieving better than anyone else in society. But back to my, my campus and my story. I had a campus and leader, one campus and leader that wasn't really that motivational. And basically what we do is we would go out in the morning and he would have a van. We would either, I think usually in the mornings, we would go to businesses. So he would take us in a business parking lot and we would just um, evangelize, give books and everything, tell everybody about the love of Christ. And by the end of the day, whenever I was with that, that person, if I had something internally going on with me and I was ready to go and get back in the van, especially if I didn't get any books out, I didn't really get encouragement. Try going back to that, that, that door over there. Try going back to the last door over there. Yeah, maybe you'll get something out. But my heart, my spirit's not in it. Mm-hmm. So whatever... I'm giving to that person at the door is not my best. They expect, they are supposed to receive my best, but if I can't give my best, then there's no point doing it. But on the flip side, I had another canvas in here. He prayed with us before we went out. He had a devotional with us before we went out. If we had a bad day and he noticed it in our, our, our face, or he could tell, he would say, come talk to me, let's pray. You know, what's going on with you? That gave me the encouragement to push forward because I wanted to do it not just for him, but I wanted to do it for God, you know? So again, the five minutes that you can spend with somebody or the little time that you can spend with somebody, not talking, but listening to their problems is very beneficial. Another myth, after a person has attempted suicide, it is unlikely he or she will try again. The truth is, people who have attempted suicide are very likely to try again. 80% of the people who die from suicide have made at least 
one previous attempt. It's not something um, that just goes away after the first attempt. This is something that has a, a mindset, a feeling that has carried on for a certain, uh, an extended period of time. So when it comes to that first suicide attempt, the mind is, dang, I didn't make it. But you know what? Nothing in my life has changed. There's still no reason to be here. I still don't have any hope. So I'm gonna try this again. And usually the second attempt is that much more dramatic. So if a person tries to take pills the first time, next time they'll try hanging. They'll do whatever it is to end the pain. Again, it's going back to ending the pain. And we'll come back to the solution later as to stopping this epidemic. People who die from suicide don't warn others. Out of 10 people who kill themselves, eight have given definite clues to their intentions. They leave numerous clues and warnings to others, although some of their clues may be nonverbal or difficult to detect. If you pay attention to a person's habits, if you, if, for instance, I'm an introverted person, I don't really talk a lot. You know, I, I'm a thinker, I like to get my thoughts together, I don't like to listen to people. But if you find, if, if somebody should find that a person like me is all of a sudden talking or deeply depressed, and again, key words as in, you know, well, I can't do this because I'm not good enough. If I see you tomorrow, um, I wish I wasn't here. I don't deserve to live. If you start hearing things like this, if you go to their house, you notice this person used to be tidy, but they're leaving dishes everywhere, the curtains are drawn. It's, it's a very dark and, and dismal atmosphere. And usually, a person that, that's very attentive can tell these things if they know a person well enough. This person has changed. So, again, there are key factors that a person gives and clues and intentions that they're giving to you silently because they're not going to tell you outright. You got to remember, they don't think you care to begin with. So you have to take into account that God made us to be relational beings for one. And, and being a relational being is reaching out to those that are around us, our family and our friends. And especially when we notice something that our spirit is telling us that this person may be hurting, that is our opportunity to reach out. These are a few signs and symptoms that should be able to tell you that something's off when you're dealing with a suicidal person. Talking about suicide is key. Any talk about suicide, dying, so far, such as I wish I hadn't been born, if I see you again, I'd rather be better off dead. Seeking out lethal means, seeking access to guns, pills, knives, or other objects that could be used in a suicide attempt. Hope for the future, feeling of helplessness, hopelessness and being trapped. There is no way out. A belief that things will never get better or change. Self-loathing, self-hatred, feelings of worthlessness, guilt, shame, self-hatred, feeling like a burden, everyone would be better off without me. Saying goodbye, unusual or unexpected visits or calls to family and friends, saying goodbye to people as if they won't be seen again. Withdrawing from others, withdrawing from friends and family, increasing social isolation, desire to be left alone. Last is self-destructive behavior, increased alcohol or drug use, reckless driving, unsafe sex, taking unnecessary risks as if they have a death wish. These are just a few factors that you can look out for anybody in your life that is suicidal. And they're, and usually they're very easy to pick up on, especially again, if you know a person is one way and you notice a complete change in their character. So pay attention to these things, they're very crucial. So now that we've gone over uh, some myths, some facts about suicide prevention and uh, what we can do to better the situation. We have to ask ourselves, what, what is a, a key solution to this issue? Because I guarantee you, each person in this room either knows somebody, 
that's attempted suicide or has thought about attempted suicide. At one point in time in my life, you know, I thought it was so taboo. I would probably never know anybody that has ever thought about suicide. It's not that, it, it, it just doesn't seem like such a plague in our society like that. But again, with the increasing, you know, uh, alarming rates of narcissism, narcissism is just basically a, a society is just I, 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 I need to do what I can, I need to get what I can, I need to better myself. Social media is, is, is very good at presenting that factor to people. And most of the time, we're so busy, we're so caught up in our own lives, in our own systemic um, arenas that we really don't pay attention to those, those little details and those factors in other people's life. And not necessarily saying that that's a, a knock, but we need to be a lot more aware of these things, especially during the holiday season. So what is the solution to preventing potential or actual suicide attempts? Listen, it, we, we, we tend to think that the biggest problems in society need the greatest and the most elaborate schemes and, and solutions to be fixed. But God gave us very simple means of reaching one another. And the simplest means that I have to use the best example um, that I can think of is when, when Jesus was doing his ministry, he would listen to people. Of course, he would heal. He do a little bit of preaching, but mainly he would fill the person's need. Life is not about us. We are very relational beings. God has created us to be relational. And one thing that I find fascinating, particularly as I, I put a microscope on the Ten Commandments, if you really think about it, the first four commandments are our relation to God, how we, how we relate to him. The next six are how we relate to one another. What I get from that is... There's a certain love because there's only one true love that we get, and that's from God. So we have to draw from that love to give from Him, to give to others. Because our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. We really don't know how to love, to be completely honest. But if we get that love from Him and we pray and we ask us, ask Him rather, to open our heart and to show us the wickedness and the ugliness in our heart, I guarantee you, because I, <laughs> it, it's worked for me you start to see that people around me really are, are hurting, you know? And I was so busy paying attention to myself and my own needs, which he takes care of anyway, that I couldn't see past what this person's going through and they're on the brink of death, of complete destruction. So I encourage you all, you know, as you move forward and you take this information that you really learn to listen to people. And when I say listen, don't listen with the intent of responding. Because a lot of times we, we'll listen to a person, we'll have a conversation with a person, but we're already in our heart thinking on the response right away. Listen with the intent of solution to their problem. Your needs are already being met, but this person has an immediate need because Satan's trying to snuff their life out at this instant. So when you listen, please listen with a heart of intent on relieving the person of the burden and the worries and the cares that this society and this life is trying to snuff out of them at every turn. I want to give you all a, a quick testimony. Um, this is my dad. And two, August 6, 2014, my life changed forever. And um, at that time, I was canvassing and I got a call from my mom. I didn't know what happened. I, I didn't know what to expect. You know, you know, I heard her crying. I know that voice my mom gives when something's wrong. Initially, I thought it was something that happened to my little brother, which is one of my worst fears, but this was the, the next worst thing. And um, she was crying just dramatically. I'm like, you know, mom, what was, what's wrong? What happened? She said, you know, your dad, your dad, your dad. What happened? He died. 15 minutes before that, <clears throat> I didn't know what I was going to do after that summer. Um, I had prayed and I asked God, what, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. You know, I wasn't sure you know, where my journey was going to take me after canvassing. 
but I knew I just got done having the best experience of my life. I was selfless all summer. I met dozens of people, whether they were Christian, or Muslim, or Buddhist. We all have a common goal in life, and that's hope and love. So I got this news, and it tore me apart. Here was a man that did everything for me. You know, um, he helped me to become the man that I am today. He taught me responsibility. And to hear him do something like that, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. The first thing I started doing, because when something happens to somebody in my, in my life I love, I blame myself if something bad happens to them. I carry a burden. I always carry a burden, especially for my family. So I started blaming myself, like what, what was it that I didn't do? Was it something I could have said, you know? But um, I realized that at that point in time, using this story and this example of my father, God gave me a bigger platform. He gave me a, a heart that I never had before, a heart for people that I never had until that incident happened. I learned again that I was one of the most selfish people in life. I mean, I'm just being very transparent with you all. I was very selfish until that summer. And I think it took that situation for me to wake up and see that life is very fragile. Life is very fragile. And not only is it fragile, but it's amazing. You know, each one of us can leave country life, country life get into an accident and our life be gone just like that. Without you telling the person that you love them, without you ever experiencing everything, these plans and these elaborate schemes that you had your whole life. And to know that my dad was not gonna be here and it was a good chance that something may happen to somebody else that I love or that I care about like that, I didn't want to ever take that chance again. So I I made the initial intention on making sure that I really love people in my life. The stranger that I've seen on the street, if I could give a word of encouragement, mind you, I'm still working on that. I'm, I'm still working for our God God's still working on my heart. But again, God has really given me a love for people that I have never had until this situation happened. And I encourage you all during this holiday season to recognize and understand everybody isn't as blessed and privileged as we are. Everybody doesn't have a, a meal every day. There are people out on the cold, even homeless people, you know, they'll take the money when you see them on the street. Sometimes they just want somebody to listen to them because they feel abandoned and they feel hopeless. My father felt abandoned, my dad felt hopeless. But one thing that I believe that he knew deep down is that even though he went through so much turmoil in his life, even though he was around alcoholics, and he was in the army, and he had a rough childhood upbringing, near the end of his life, I, I really believe he knew Jesus was calling out to him. And it was a spiritual struggle with him going on at the time. Everything that we do in our life is, is 90% spiritual. The other half is physical. But I have a hope that I'll see him again. But it shouldn't get to that point with any of you all. I want you all to love and reach out to the people that are in your life. Because, again, you, you, you just never know when it's your last day or when it's their last day. I'll leave you all with this. Bible verse, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He cares for each one of us in this room. He shows it every single day, putting the breath, the breath of life in our bodies. And with that breath, he's calling us to do a few simple tasks each and every day. To serve your fellow man, your fellow woman, to love unconditionally, 
whether somebody has hurt you, whether somebody has wronged you, whether somebody cuts you off on the road, whether your boss fired you, love unconditionally because he demonstrated the greatest love by putting his son on the cross. That's the greatest demonstration of care. I think any of us could ever conceive or imagine. Cast your anxieties, your worries, and your cares at the feet of the cross. Lay them there and walk away with a new life that he will give you in exchange for that burden. Because it's too heavy for us, any of us anyway, we don't know what to do with it. That's the result of suicide. But again, it doesn't have to be that way. So, um, I want to thank you all for coming. I appreciate each person in this room. And um, remember the reason for the season going forward. It's not about material gain, but it's about the gain of love, the gain of compassion that each one of us can receive and give to one another. Thank you. I finally want to be alive